I would like to welcome you to our uh, fall community forum. I would also like to welcome the Antietam Valley School District School Board. We will be having a uh, joint hearing of an uh, update to the uh, planning study that was done uh, last year for the, uh, some more uh, specific goals. I would like to mention we have two new members of the board since we've met with the public. Dr. Tamura, Tim Tamura, and uh, Mike Chapina, who uh, have assumed positions recently. So for now, Dr. Moyer, you like to go? Thank you. Just want to make sure uh, everyone can hear. Uh, as you recall, last May we were here and did a uh, full presentation of the the wise report that was uh, shared with you at that time. Uh, in it, if you recall, we had up to eight options for your consideration of things that could happen in uh, combining with districts, and then uh, actually down to two or three models that we thought would be the most viable. As a result of that information, the boards then came back and said, how about we look at these two specific models, basic models, and see uh, what comes of that. And that's what we did, and that's what you have in front of you this evening. So what we're calling model one and model two is what we were asked to come back uh, to explain this evening. Uh, the difference is or in the grade configurations by building. Uh, in model one, we have uh, a high school that has grades 10 to 12. We have two junior high schools, and then we have elementary schools that have grades K through six. In model two, we have a full high school, four years, grades nine to 12. Uh, we have two middle schools for grades six to eight, and then we have elementary schools which have grades uh, K through five. Uh, yeah, K through five. Uh, just a quick reminder that as we went through the demographics for both districts, uh, we're looking at enrollments that are not at this time predicted to increase. Uh, in fact, probably in the short run uh, to decrease, which helps to take the pressure off of, of this, both districts to, to have more capacity in a short period of time. We don't see that happening, so that gives, in a combined school district, the new board, if that would happen, uh, 10 buildings that could be assigned in the most efficient manner. Now, of course, one of the things that uh, you need to consider is keeping the status quo, and that is to independent as they are, are now school districts with their own administrations, uh, tax rates, tax base, etc. The, the advantages of that, of course, are that you continue to do what you do the way you do it now, and all of the uh, effort that goes into change uh, is avoided, at least in the short run. What you lose, of course, is the ability to uh, have the resources of both school districts, existing school districts, to use in the most efficient way and to uh, cut some costs, especially in terms of administration, since you would go from two sets of administrations to one. And also, uh, student capacity uh, is going to be an issue with some of these buildings, uh, will remain an issue. And so there is, again, opportunity to use the 10 buildings to keep students uh, in their buildings longer and to offer uh, special programs uh, in the middle school and high school. So what do we get in model one? The transition would begin in elementary school. It would take about three years uh, to, to combine two districts. Again, we have high school with grades 10 to 12. We have two junior high schools. The junior high schools would be 
as shown in the report, the current junior high school in Exeter Township School District and the current middle high school in Antietam School District. Uh, it means that students who are now in Antietam High School uh, in the 10th grade next year would still graduate from Antietam High School. And if you look at the both models, uh, all students who are now in Exeter Township will continue to graduate from Exeter High School. Uh, we know that enrollments are, are coming down a little bit, uh, about 12% in the middle, middle grades and about uh, 3% in the high school. And that also will help in the short term, whether you combine or not, to address some capacity issues. I think uh, the issue of capacity is certainly more uh, germane to the Exeter Township School District uh, with their higher enrollment and more students uh, per building. Uh, and especially in the middle grades, uh, this, this option to give the school board some uh, leverage in, in moving students and keeping the capacity uh, more or less the same and not being exceeded in the building. So what happens in model one? Well, you have changes uh, in Exeter Township where you would go from the three existing elementary schools to four elementary schools. The fourth being the building we're in now, uh, which was built originally to house grades eight to six. And so all students, whether uh, you're from Antietam or you're from Exeter, would spend grades K through six in the same building, K through six, same building. What happens, uh, you have two junior high schools, and that means uh, one in Antietam and one in Exeter. And the difficult part now for the Exeter Township School District will be to reassign some students in grades uh, at the high school, some in grades uh, seven through, I'm sorry, six through eight, in the junior high school, some will go to Antietam, some will stay in the Exeter Junior High School. We follow that uh, right then in the immediate school has become an elementary school. So you have about 400 students out of your student body that will now attend the junior high school in the Antietam building. Those will be the only students in Exeter Township that ever leave the school district as it now exists. They then go back to the high school and graduate from Exeter High School. So we have some busing. You have about 250 to 275 uh, students from Antietam that will have to go to Exeter High School. Uh, and I think this will be uh, the biggest challenge for you at uh, the junior high school level. On the other hand, Every building is used in the combined district, and every school building will have excess capacity uh, under this model. Most of the uh, challenge will count again in student transportation and reassignment of uh, existing faculty and staff, uh, for instance, uh, from right into junior high school. But that is easily done because whether you have an elementary certificate or a secondary certificate, you can, you can teach the middle school or junior high school. So what happens then under model two, where we have, again, all children in the same elementary school until grade six, and have uh, two, uh, uh, at grade six then, and they move into one of two middle schools, which operates the same as model one junior high schools, half of those three grades, students for half of those three grades would be in the Exeter Middle School and half would be in the Antietam Middle School. Again, the students who are now attending Antietam High School, Middle and Senior High School, would, would remain in Antietam. So you're, never, you're not busing any students from Antietam to Exeter until, depending on the model, uh, they go to high school and that's either grade nine or grade 10. Right? 
Again, about 340 Exeter students will go to the Antietam Middle School. And Antietam students, uh, again, would stay in their own buildings until grade nine under this model. So no bus until grade 10. Uh, Again, about 250, 275 students would be the uh, bus from Antietam to Exeter High School. Uh, we've gone through uh, briefly some of the savings. And, and by the way, there's more detail on busing in the report on uh, pages 9 and 10. The expenses that you see in there associated with uh, busing uh, were provided by uh, the Exeter uh, Township School District and uh, we have used their figures. Uh, we have not tried to uh, outguess them in any way. Uh, I would uh, mention that on page nine, uh, in the last full paragraph, I talked about 80% of the, those costs being covered. Uh, the way it would work uh, in this district, not all of the, the expenses uh, would be eligible for reimbursement. Therefore, the 80% uh, is in this case would be too high. The actual amount, and you'll see this uh, in the finance part, is about $331,000 that would be uh, provided by the state under the transportation subsidy. Just want to point that out. Again, academic programs, we have always uh, wanted to emphasize the academic programs uh, as being uh, an important part of this. Uh, I know oftentimes it comes down to cost, but uh, again, just to make the point that both districts have something to bring to this table academically and in terms of support services. Uh, special needs uh, students, uh, the change there would be uh, basically in Antietam, uh, and to save money, uh, students that are now uh, bus to the intermediate unit would be uh, if they remain in the combined district, there is a uh, savings there as well. And so we move on to page 12, where we look again uh, uh, at the cost. We have two different kinds of costs. We have upfront costs in here, and then we have the recurring costs, uh, which will uh, even so go away over time, uh, but they're recurring because uh, they won't happen in the first year, uh, as would, for instance, the changes to the central administration. Uh, we have also uh, given you an update for the next school year of, of what those uh, savings would be. And uh, it's, uh, it's increased to about $660,000. Uh, faculty, again, are affected here in two ways. One, as grade configurations change at buildings, uh, there will be some reassignment of teachers to, to different buildings. However, given the cluster of, of buildings among the two districts, uh, there's not a great deal of distance uh, between many of these schools. Uh, the two outliers, so to speak, are Lorraine Elementary, uh, which is uh, by itself in the southern part of the district, and really uh, the Antietam Middle High School, which is at the northern end of this district. Um, at this time, we haven't, because there's a lot of planning and how this change would happen, we haven't given you any savings. Just to be conservative, uh, we have the same number of buildings, if we have the same number of principals. Uh, there are assistant principals that, again, could change buildings depending on grade configuration, uh, but we've not looked to uh, eliminate uh, any of the positions, uh, really building specific. They've all been at the central office level. Uh, with the exception that you know, a combined district might look to close uh, Montana Primary Center, which has kindergarten and first grade. Uh, that uh, would be possible and would free up a building for any number of, of new uses that the combined district might consider. Uh, but uh, the only uh, warning on that uh, is uh, a zoning, you would need a zoning change uh, from Montana to do uh, some things, but not all things. But, you know, keep that in mind. Uh, whether you use Model 1 or Model 2, these changes 
pretty much the same. Uh, and so we'll get into financial considerations on page 14. Uh, we're looking at uh, uh, savings, uh, the structure of the essential office of uh, about 660,000. Uh, we're looking at uh, there will be a change in specific administration and support services, although we're looking at the zero in the first year. Uh, there are possibilities for savings. It's not just uh, losing positions. It's about having the right team in place, and sometimes that means you can do more with less, and sometimes it means you can't. So that would be part of the planning process. Uh, additional student transportation, which is a cost. Uh, savings by keeping special needs students uh, and them in, in the combined district and uh, other uh, upfront costs uh, we total about $65,000. Uh, it's relatively low in this case because uh, we would expect that frankly ex uh, Exeter County School District would remain the name of the combined district so you're not out uh, <coughs> Doing stationary and making all the kinds of changes you, you would with the name change. Model two is uh, pretty much the same. Again, because all the buildings are in use and what has changed, the configuration is great within those buildings. Uh, there are two recurring costs uh, that would have to be addressed in the first, again, assuming you have a three year implementation, that would be addressed over those three years. You have uh, the additional cost of placing uh, Antietam <coughs> teachers on the Exeter Township uh, School District Collective Bargaining Agreement, which you just approved tonight, so I haven't seen. But, but now you'll be able to uh, uh, calculate exactly, perhaps, what that would mean. Uh, however, uh, using costs estimated for the next school year, uh, that comes to about $805,000. That would be reduced over the three years uh, till uh, at which time uh, when the uh, consolidation occurs, if it does, uh, you have a new contract that covers all teachers. And uh, and Tiedem is still uh, Now, you have some uh, loss of revenues from uh, the Antietam uh, when, when you Go to a single. My two sides. I'm sorry. There we go. When you go to uh, a combined district, the millage has to be the same uh, for all property values, and so there is an adjustment there in the first year of about nine hundred eighty-two thousand. If you go with the lowest uh, amount, which is usually what happens but isn't mandated. So again, you have three years to uh, bring together those millage rates uh, so that by the time there is a combined school district, everyone uh, would be paying the same millage rate on their property. And in the meantime, you, all, you also have uh, some opportunities for shared services uh, where uh, combining or not, uh, the districts can work together as neighbors and uh, save the taxpayers some money and increase uh, services to uh, to the children and perhaps even uh, expand the uh, curriculum to some shared teaching. So in a nutshell, and that really is a nutshell, uh, those are the two models you asked us to look at one last time. Uh, and so if you have any questions, uh, uh, thank you for your summary. Um, first, could you explain the dynamics of why it would take three years and not one, two, three, or four? I mean, <coughs> what are we facing in terms of if, if we decide on a merger, what, what would that look like over three years? All right. Uh, when, when a vote, when a resolution is passed by each board to combine, if that happens, that resolution would include the date that the, the, the consolidation takes place. Okay? It could be the end of this year, it could be three years down the road. To give sufficient time for planning, you need, uh, again, you'll be coming into one curriculum instead of two. Uh, you'll be 
you know, reassigning some teachers to, to other buildings, you'll need to give parents time to adjust the idea that maybe there'll be some changes in, in schools uh, over, over time. Um, so I, it, I, I can only tell you that when it's been tried other places, it's taken two to three years and usually three. Thank you. Did I hear you tonight in terms of buildings? I thought I heard you say there'd be four elementary school buildings. There, there would actually be six, six. Uh, in a combined district. But, but with there access be, capacity. Each, each one of them would have access capacity. Would have so, capacity for growth. I, the word access isn't probably the best word, but, but each building would have uh, potential for growth. For growth, but, but the projections also show that the enrollments go, will be going down. In the short term, yes. So and, I mean, do you have an analysis that would help us decide which buildings should be closed or could be closed in order to uh, create some more savings? We took a hard look at that. I have to be honest, uh, within Exeter Township School District, we, we can't find any uh, opportunity to close a school. Again, yeah, not a great choice of words there. The, the enrollment at every grade level is such that uh, they're just, you know, the only thing that works here is to reduce some of the enrollment in, in the existing district in the middle grades over to what would be an Antietam Junior High School or Antietam Middle School to help uh, ease some of that congestion that, that's being seen there now and to avoid the district from having to expand or, or to do new building uh, really in the intermediate future. Uh. In terms of the transportation, I've um, heard of that 80% that the, could be what the, the state would reimburse us. Is, does that include the additional buses that we need to purchase? It wouldn't include, well. I mean, is that, do we need to get a, a good sense of what the startup costs are and what the recurring costs are? All right, can we, can we share that? Yeah. The one, the analysis we have the next week. Council? Yeah, I will just share the analysis that your district has complete. The 80% doesn't hold the way I presented it here because there are expenses beyond buses involved here. You know, there's, there's expansion of storage space and, and maintenance, and besides the addition of, of new buses, there, there's more to it than just. Rolling buses, and some of that is covered uh, by the state subsidy, and some of that will not. Doctor, answer. Uh, yes. Well, I did the analysis. Uh, what's reimbursed by the state is your, based on the formula, I mean, your operating costs. Two buttons. Uh, your operating costs, and it's based on formula, um, as well as reimbursement for FICA and uh, retirement contributions. So the number that I had come up with was approximately 43% of the additional operating costs. So we'd have to look at those figures again to you, you have the figures, it's just uh, the subsidy doesn't apply to every expense that's involved here. So yes. what you said was the 80% is really not an accurate figure. Right, right, for the, for the total of the waivers, right. We'll just leave it at that so it doesn't get confusing. But uh, the, the, the amount would go up uh, definitely by, I think it was what, 331000 $331,000, but that's not 80% of the expense. I, I guess it would be, um, on page 11 you mentioned how special education could be at the Lausch building. To accommodate the increased number of <coughs> children with special needs. This is, but there are no other children at that building. How, how would you? 
that seems contradictory to uh, the requirements for mainstreaming and inclusion of children with special needs. These, would, these are the students who currently are attending school at the intermediate unit. They're from Antietam. Mm -hmm. Well, would we want those children to be uh, mainstreamed within our, our regular schools? Uh, um, I don't think they can be. Uh, I think they're going to, maybe they, maybe Exeter Township could accommodate them. I, I'm not sure. changes in revenue and expenditure on page 15. Um, but, I mean, could we come to a bottom line? I, I don't see that yet in the, uh, the analysis. And, and bottom line, I'm saying, what, what is it going to cost for, in terms of startup costs? And then how will the savings, the recurring savings, offset the, the uh, change in revenue and the change in the teacher's contract. Uh, I mean, do we need more? Is that a, the next step? or a... Now that a contract is in place here, uh, we, could, we can do more in terms of the cost. Uh, however, you know, we still don't have a contract. Uh, and then to them, so we have to use the what they're operating under now. It it is a startup cost in a way, but it's 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 a recurring cost that is going to have that mitigates itself by the time the consolidation takes place. It's part of the plan. All right, the millage rates change, uh, perhaps in the short term, uh, contractual. See, I can't talk about that. That's my. I can't talk about it. It's, it's not fair to uh, Antio. If I, anything I say could be used in negotiations. I, I can't say I'm sorry. Well, I mean, the problem I have is in our long range plan, we, we need to say to the citizens of, of the districts uh, what are the recurring cost savings, what are the expenses, and, and what's the bottom line? All right, uh, what we can do is do it by, you know, for each of three years. Mm -hmm. So that by the fourth year, everything well was out. Is that what you're looking for? <coughs> is that something reasonable to ask that we yeah, would address? We do that. And but, just, but again, just, it's a guess. I mean, it's up to you. Well, it's, to it's a best that. estimate. Okay. I mean, okay. Sort of a rational, pro I mean, based on your experience and what we okay. might expect. Realize there are no guarantees. But we, we need to use the, the best data we have to come to a, a decision. Well, in, in looking at the numbers, and just so I'm on the same page, it appears that as far as any type of incremental savings, it has to be either with buildings being closed or staff being reduced, correct? Wait. No. I it doesn't have to be that. It, 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 the big savings is is in the in the facilities, more more or less. Okay, because that's where you take on the debt. That's where you have large expenses in time. Uh, this allows 
you know, actually the school district to not look at a building or renovation that actually that for, for a long time. So I, I, I would argue that. One of the other things that happens as you uh, change the grade config configurations by building and you, you move some staff and some teachers want to be, uh, you know, certainly way less than half, because uh, we're not changing them in grades, uh, you have some attrition along the way and you may not have to uh, replace every teacher. We're not saying get rid of teachers, but after everything's in place and the plan is set, you may find that, uh, you know, there's some efficiencies there and, and through attrition, you'll, you'll be okay. Uh, it, you, you need to have, you, you know, in a school district with 400 teachers, you would need to lose about nine through attrition to make up for the difference in salaries going from Antietam, plus the bargaining unit, to Exeter, plus the bargaining unit. I, I just think that attritional savings are gonna be difficult. I, I think that when you look at it, I mean, I think in the simplest forms, David, you had asked about it is, what we would need to look at is the, the difference in the contract, which is real money, uh, the difference in the millage, which is real money, and then the transportation cost, which is, which is real money. So we have to look at that. And then what we'd have to do is counterbalance that with potential savings of administration, staff, and facility. I mean, in any, in any merger, that's it. There's, we're not saving in pens and papers any, it's just not going to happen. So I think what we need to do is take a look at five or six large numbers to see where the bottom line would be and go from there. Because, I mean, we have a lot of these numbers here, but again, if, if buildings are not, if, if a building would not be closed and all the buildings are kept open, I don't see where you could have the savings. I, I just don't see it. Any questions or comments from the NT? Take any information. Could, could I ask a question, Dr. Moore? And thank you, by the way, for updating the information from last week so quickly when we found out that it wasn't the exact scenario we had in mind. I appreciate that. But in looking at the costs that you list, whether it be upfront costs or whether it be recurring costs, there are things that I'm thinking in my head are going to be big costs that I don't see here. I don't know if I'm missing something. I certainly have no background in mergers but I do have a background in education and teachers, and although I see some figures here for uniforms and sports issues, I don't really see figures for the educational end of things. Whether it be, it, to me, when you're reassigning teachers what, uh, and you're changing curricula and so forth, whether it be Exeter teachers or Antietam teachers, you're going to have to do a lot of staff development to get people ready for that change. Uh, you're going to have to have a lot of transition planning. There are going to be some legal costs to get, you know, to come to one collective bargaining agreement in three years or whatever, or, um, you know, even in, as far as how we assign teachers and who, you know, gets this course or that course. And, um, nor do I see anything in terms of costs of uh, curricular resources, whether it be textbooks or other resources. So in my mind, as an educator, those would be things that I want to focus on, getting everybody ready. And you know, when those kids walk in, those teachers have to be ready, perhaps to teach a course or a grade level they've never before taught, to, or at least, even if it's the same course, to teach with textbooks or uh, other resources that, that they've never used. And that takes a lot of work in my experience. And I just wonder why none of that has been addressed or is there some reason that you don't count that? Uh, legal costs, like I think I said, uh, nothing in terms of technology. Wouldn't there be costs for updating software, maybe bandwidth expansion? I don't know, I'm not a tech person, but um, you know, those were some of the other things that I was thinking that I didn't see in here, uh, but that I think are going to 
be a real issue that we would have to deal with, all of us collectively would have to deal with, uh, you know, and it's a lot of time, and time is money, and so forth, um, as well as actual purchase of, of things. Is there any reason why that wasn't included? Or maybe it's just impossible to estimate, I don't know. Well, it's, it's not impossible to estimate. I don't know how how close we would, we would get to it. Uh, it's, it's difficult. Okay, I, I don't really quite yet understand perhaps what the board is expecting. Okay, uh, we went to some length here to figure out a way to make sure that buildings were not closed. But, but yet, you know, now we have a discussion about closing buildings again. I, I didn't think that was still on the table. Uh, well, we did say, uh, when, and when your original came in and it did not involve the use of this building, I immediately, I don't want to speak for, for our, our board, but um, this is a new building. It's a very energy efficient building. It will not need a lot of repairs in the next you know, foreseeable future. Uh, it functions very well. It's right in the heart of our school district, right next to our, our secondary buildings. And um, you know, to me, I would never see closing this building that doesn't mean I you know I don't know I don't want to speak for the board again it doesn't mean that uh, we would never consider closing any building but this certainly would not be on my list yeah. uh, so I I don't think that that was ever meant to infer that you know we would never consider closing any buildings and I don't know how Antietam feels about the closing of any of their buildings but I you know uh, I, I just wouldn't think of this building as being on the block to be closed at the last steering committee meeting, and uh, you can correct me over there if I'm wrong, we discussed closing two buildings and uh, basically consolidating the uh, children in the remaining buildings and the two most up, from what I understood, were the primary center and the uh, elementary school in Mount Penn because of the uh, lack of playground space and just in fact get it out of the uh, city but that was obviously not brought forward to you for for this uh, update was I wrong or? no I mean we, we talked about not taking anything off the table with regards to closing buildings as I recall it was it was an option Particular which ones was it decided? Okay. Maybe I was just saying what was in the back of my head. Uh, another question that I would imagine there'd be a significant legal cost that I don't see in the document in terms of just all the legalities to merging one district and bringing together different, not only the teachers' contract, but contracts with outside vendors. Uh, policies and things like that. <coughs> any any background on that, to, what that would cost? No, other than collective bargaining agreements, I don't think uh, no other contracts are coming to mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a larger district, it's not a different district. So no, other than collective bargaining agreements, I'm not sure that the uh, um, policy. Yeah. Well, there, there must be bond. I mean, in terms of a long-term debt, both districts have bonds. And All right, thank you. Any other questions? Um, you have in your scenarios that um, we have K through six 
and uh, and then K through four or K through eight or uh, K through five. K through five. So right now, in, in our school district, we have a K through four, right. and then we have a five and six, seven and eight, and nine through twelve. And I know uh, our superintendent uh, had has said that she would like to keep nine through twelve. Uh, she believes that the ninth graders, I think you said that. Mm -hmm. just, yes. Mm -hmm. But you also said something like, um, with you having K through eight, I don't think there's too many teachers. Are, aren't the certifications now K through six? Isn't it K through six? Right. No, K through eight. no, but she, he said that with being, you know, with sixth, seventh, and eighth, he said there would be no problem because. Um, Teachers have paid through eight certification and they don't. That's, that's correct. Yes, but yeah. Yeah, you would need, you would need both elementary and secondary teachers in a sixth grade scenario, and you would need to use all the secondary teachers in a seventh through ninth scenario. You could not use, I think your, your study may have said that you could use either or. Yeah, yeah. In a six through eight, you can use a mixture of both. You can't really use either or. Under No Child Left Behind, the highly qualified teacher rule has kicked in, and um, you need subject specific teachers above grade six. Um, there is, yeah. Yeah, but that, yeah, that's maybe more for the newer teachers. That's that's a very new, yeah. Any other questions, Dr. Moore? Um, yeah, I have another question. Um, right now, the NTM school district uh, only has uh, teachers under a contract where you have outsourced all your other support personnel. So uh, if we did merge, you, can, you don't have any, uh, you know, you talk about all these cost savings, but uh, what would it cost us to uh, bring, bring on, I guess we'd have to hire employees because you would, yeah, you have to make a contract it out, don't you? Or have all your personnel services contracted out? I mean, your, your support services. <laughs> <laughs> I think what you're what you're addressing, and, and we did not bring it to, uh, uh, to, to consultants' uh, attention. Our support people are our employees, but they are not unionized. They are not part of the bargaining. So uh, your point is well taken. Uh, your folks are uh, in any union, so therefore transitioning into your school district would uh, require them to also move on to your uh, support personnel contacts. And you know, I, that was one of the issues that we overlooked in the initial study. Uh, well, it is a significant factor. Actually, we, we did include that in, in, the, in the final report. And I, I remember that the cost of doing that was about $26,000 a year. Well, do you, do you uh, contract out also your um, like uh, food services? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, the only thing we contract out is our uh, our bus service through Berks County. Area. But those people aren't on, uh, aren't union members either. The ones that are on the uh, like the your food service, all your support. Our, our food service personnel are our employees, but yeah, again, but they're they're not union. Any further questions from either of the boys? Thank you, Dr. Morris. Thank you, Dr. Morris. Now we'll accept uh, comments or questions from the general uh, audience. Come forward, please, please to the lectern and identify yourself. Um, I'm an ASSER resident. Um, on page 15, the 
sentence says, there will be no changes in debt payments. How much is your debt? And if we're going to merge, obviously we have to take over your debt. So as an extra resident, what's in it for me besides paying your bills? I think the uh, Antietam debt service is 8% of their uh, operating allowance while ours is 15. So if there's any complaints to be had about taking over a debt, it would be in the opposite direction. The opposite direction. But if they're going to, if you're going to keep it, I still don't understand how it benefits us. I understand it benefits the students because you can merge them and keep them together. But you guys keep saying it's, you got this cost saving, these low cost saving. But the only thing you can you know, guarantee is that the tax is raising. But how do we cap that without unfair advantage of sharing the tax bracket? Because you got buses, you have this, but there's no actual cost. There's no cost models. There's nothing that says this is how much you guys spend each year, right? And there's nothing that shows any, like that would make it worth it for us to take home. Like, I don't understand what the cost benefit is for us as a Homeowner. I see expected cost, 982000 That's the lost revenues that you guys would lose a little bit. And combined district would lose the military decision of the two boards was to equalize the military at the lower rate. That's what that figure is about. Yeah. 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 The, the, uh, the assumption made by the study for that amount of money is that the two boards in a combined district would make a decision to lower the millage rate for all residents to the current rate of the extra township school district. And that's the difference in the amount of millage if Antietam dropped back to the extra millage rate. So Antietam's paying a higher tax rate, right? Mm -hmm. yes. And right. extra paying a lower tax rate. Right. And you guys are spending, we're spending more money. Yes. That's what you said? By a lot. By a lot. Okay. <coughs> so, <coughs> how does it benefit me? I see the trade if I didn't get deal, I'd be all for it. Because obviously, my taxes are lowering and my kids are merging with different facilities. But how does it benefit me? I, so I, I, mean, I, I see you guys go back and forth, but I still don't see how. As a homeowner, what is the cost savings? What is the what is the benefit for me if it's just lowering your township's taxes? Well, I, if I can speak for what I've heard of committee meetings, uh, you know, the the thing that has echoed throughout all of our meetings has been a, a high emphasis and priority on it not costing extra township residents more money to go through the merger. That's why we're going through all these studies and to, to actually try to narrow down exactly what the cost would be and whether or not it can be uh, expenditure neutral. And the secondary, the primary emphasis is actually academic opportunity for, for kids. For example, in Antietam, we graduated 63 in our class last year. It's just very hard, it's just very hard to uh, to offer all the things that uh, we want to offer to those, those students. So again, as Dr. May said, the emphasis is of trying to make sure that we understand how to offer those opportunities uh, without impacting your taxes. And, and that's, that's a goal, that's what we're studying. And of course, our main objective has nothing to do with taxes. It has to do with making sure we offer our kids the academic opportunities that they deserve. Yeah, I think, uh, I think we make a mistake when we, uh, when we really focus in on millage rate. I think what you have are two separate districts. It's one of the problems in Pennsylvania is simply millage rate is nothing more than a function of tax base. Here's an opportunity. Exeter at this point will have a larger tax base. That's a plus. We will pick up assets in the way of buildings where we will not have to engage, we will not have to engage in a building project for, a ver for nothing that we can see out there. So I think those are advantages. 
But this idea that their tax rate is higher, our tax rate is lower, is simply because our mill produces that much more revenue that we collect. Uh, I was at a meeting a, well, about six weeks ago now, and I was, uh, an Exeter mill produces about a million two hundred thousand dollars in revenue. Now I'd like you to take an example. I was uh, at a meeting at the Parkland School District up around Allentown. Their mill increases or produces about seven point five million dollars. Think about what the difference in our, in our millage rate must be. Uh, if, I'm not. Sh you're, you guys, your mill is what? A little under four hundred thousand? Is that right? About two hundred forty-two thousand. A lot under four hundred. <laughs> so again, the function of the rate. I don't think you should be comparing that. I think what you need to look at is this is an opportunity for us to expand the tax base in, a, in an area where, I'll tell you what, that's the only way districts are going to function if we don't find another way to fund that public education is that we're just going to have to have more tax base. Antietam's rate would decline 8.4%. By law, Antietam's teachers would receive a raise solely due to the merger. There would be less opportunities and extracurricular activity with the combined school district. Most performance metrics consider Exeter to be the better performing school district. Why jeopardize that status within the community and in the eyes of college guidance counselors? Why put the Exeter student experience at risk? Why put Exeter teacher jobs at risk? Is our school district so well off from a performance perspective that the only logical step, next step is to pursue a merger. I find that hard to believe. My concerns regarding this merger proposal reside solely with you. We elected you to make decisions in the best interest of Exeter. I, along with many others, believe this is an unpopular decision and that there is zero basis to move forward and to continue to hold this over our heads. This open-ended research process with no timeline is, un is unacceptable, as is the mindset that a merger is going to happen sooner. I'm not opposed to any student coming to Exeter to take a class that might not be offered at their school. What I don't understand is why the board is going down this road for Exeter students and residents. On October 2nd, President Quinter wrote an extensive comment on the ETSD blog in which he gave an informative background of his personal life. However, his transition from his background into what I was expecting to be his pitch as to why this would be good for Exeter students was a huge disappointment, and I quote, so why is the board spending time to consider a merger with Antietam? Isn't it natural for Antietam parents to want the best opportunity for their children, unquote? We are your constituents. We are who you should be selling on this proposal. You have done a poor job in selling this to us. If you want to comment on my remarks, then that's fine, but I have three direct questions I would hope you'd like to answer. Superintendent Martin, thanks for the quick email replies over the last few months. I appreciate you bringing me up to speed on certain things. At this point in time, based on the feasibility report and your research, do you have an opinion for or against the merger? I do, and at this point, I am not in favor of a full merger. However, that being said, I would be in favor of a different option, uh, but what really kind of confused me is the first time we got together to meet as two boards, all the other options were, were more or less discarded. What I hear my colleague Dr. May saying and what I hear uh, the, the board president, uh, Dave, saying, oh, I'm sorry, Dave, I forgot your last name for a moment. Um, is, is that they want more opportunities for their kids. I think that's wonderful. They're our neighbors. We're in education to help kids. And yes, I'm, I'm hired to help the Exeter kids, but these are our neighbors, and I believe we should do what we can. Um, and, but I think we, I don't think it needs a full merger. You're looking for, understandably, more opportunities for maybe your high school students, because with so few, it's hard to provide that. We do provide those for our students. 
but I don't understand why we can't look at something like a regional high school or an alignment of our high school schedule so that your students could come over and take classes. We're, I, for one, as a superintendent, would be happy to do that. Our curriculum in grades K to 8 uh, it is very similar. I really don't see e either district having a lot more resources or a lot more to offer. I think it's very similar, similar, so I don't understand why a full merger would be the only option. I can't believe that not aligning our high school schedules at the very least would be harder, uh, or, or aligning our high school schedules would be more difficult than achieving a full merger uh, especially if our, you know, I think Dr. Moyer in your initial report, and maybe even this report, uh, you said there has to be an equal benefit to both districts, and I don't think that people, uh, I, and I won't speak for everyone obviously, but most of the people of Exeter, uh, I'm not hearing that they feel that there is an uh, equal benefit. and. That's great. If we have more courses to offer merely because of our size and for no other reason, then why can't we figure out a way to work on that <coughs> rather than shoot for a full merger? And the two models that we looked at basically had most of the kids staying in their own buildings in grades K to 8 anyway, except for some of our kids in, at the junior high level that would go over, or middle level that would go over to Antietam and, and I, you know, I think a lot of our families might prefer that they stay here in Exeter. Um, I don't think we're bursting at the seams in any of our buildings, including this one, uh, so that we can't sustain, su sustain our students for the next several years. I think, um, you know, if we combine both high schools totally into our building, we're going to have a problem, at least for the next few years after that, it tends to get easier. But, um, I'm sorry, that's a long answer to a short question, but I, I felt that since you got up and asked me the question, you kind of warned me a few days ago you were going to do that, and I thought a lot about it, and I thought, what would I say? Well, I have to say the truth. I'm hired as a superintendent to give my opinions on all matters, and um, I've, I've shared my opinions with our board and, and with Dr. Mays in the past, and I just think there's another solution in there that could answer the needs of Antietam and also the residents of Exeter. I think that's what we're looking for is information, so. And then I don't know if board members are, my second question, are comfortable doing the same, or any, well, to give us an idea of where you stand right now, or who's for and who's against, so we have an idea as a public. We're, we're trying to get information tonight, so. Does anybody want to say they're for? You're asking for the board to vote. I'm, you don't have to. Vote. And uh, and we're not we're not done with that. I'll tell you where I feel, and I think it's pretty obvious. I did not agree with Dr. Martin, but uh, fortunately, Dr. Martin's a professional, and we can talk. So, why would we want to combine? One, I didn't get into the. One, if I can make this revenue neutral, where it does not impact your taxes whatsoever, and I commend you on your study of this uh, topic. You put some work into it, and I appreciate that. But if I can make this revenue neutral, and there are sheets around where we're actually, we have an excess after everything is combined, then we're just, expanding our tax base we are giving an opportunity for education to everybody at no cost to us but I, and i understand that and i get that point but you're telling us to take on more potentially oh where's the benefit exit there's nothing else that the board could be looking at from either anything related to within the district to improve right, I, I can make money off the antietam school district How's that? I'm not talking about money. I no, don't I, said anything well, yeah, about money. You're talking, if me. I make money off of their <coughs> school district uh, and, and your taxes can decrease, 
Isn't that's that what we're talking about? No. No. My point was, I am not saying anything about taxes. I think that theirs will come down and they're getting a rate. My point is, is that in all of this, you're telling me there's nothing else that we can do to improve the Exeter School District. So what the next step is, is we might as well just do a merger. No, I don't there's, know what lots, the of, there's lots of things going on right now. Uh, Dr. Davies is spending a lot of time working up a STEM program. <coughs> Uh, we are enhancing this school district as this goes along, but that doesn't mean that is that does not make it exclusive of anything else. Our programs will continue to develop. I'm working on some other things that uh, may provide additional advantages to uh, any students that go to our schools. I get that the revenue shortfall is an immaterial number. I just don't read that report and see what my children are gaining as a benefit from going through potentially all this over the coming years. And then we have to sit through this for months and months and months because right. it's open-ended. And then I just heard the presentation. There's a total misunderstanding about what you want, what they want, and what they're returning to you. And if he's getting paid every time he comes out here to get this, and like, oh, I didn't know I needed this, or I didn't need that. I will put this in He was paid one flat fee. So it didn't so cost the same perspective. The whole point is enough time enough. But I understand you guys when are is it, when is it? When is it time to stop thinking about moving ahead? When can we be satisfied? But I'm never moving. satisfied. I, I am never satisfied. There's something that's going to be a benefit. So I'll let other people talk. But I, would, I would just appreciate. You had two more questions. Well, the one, yeah, that was it. The other was I wanted three material benefits for our children in Exeter. Thank you very Thank much, you. Mr. Chair. I, I would like to say I would like to say that I agree 100% with Dr. Martin's um, evaluation. I think one of the places where maybe Auntie and, and we could also uh, work together would be in building a preschool. That the, the research is, is absolutely there that children who live in poverty, which we do have in Exeter and you do have in Antietam, when they are exposed to preschool education uh, prior to going into kindergarten, they have a much a great, greater leg up in, in filling that gap, that educational gap, which their parents, for whatever reason, uh, could not fill. Uh, because of, of, of where they live at, at, in their poverty. So uh, I, I can see that would be another place where that would be very beneficial, not only to our students, but to Antietam students, because we both have children that live in poverty at a, you know, at a great at a rate. Ours is what, 15%, 16% right now? 26%. 26? You know, I don't know if it's the whole 26, uh, in some of the schools, right? But is it the No, it's about 26% of the entire district is on the one Well, then we do need preschool, and I think, uh, and I think Antietam is, you know, is just as much as we are. So there will be a great place, not only for the high school, but at the beginning end, the beginning of school, because that's where the foundation is, is, is laid for uh, educational success. Thank you very much, Pat. Sir. I'd just like to piggyback on what Dr. Martin had asked and Dr. Bender had asked and Dr. Moyer. Back on April 30th, either you or your other colleagues in this year had given an estimation on legal fees of at least a minimum of $100,000. There's a question raised on that tonight. Was it a comment by yourself or somebody, somebody that was with you that evening or two of them? What that was predicated on was another district that you guys had been involved with, and that was your estimation. So we're back and cut the takes. There is a number out there for your legal fees. Um, one thing that I did see in here that I don't think any of us have addressed so far tonight. Is getting along fine. Good. Uh, my name is Hunter Aarons. I'm a senior at Exeter Senior High School. Uh, the point that I wanted to bring up is uh, 
the disadvantages of not merging and keeping the status quo, problems on the horizon for all school districts in Pennsylvania will need to be addressed separately by the existing districts. Uh, Mr. Stop, I remember that you talked about on April 30th of uh, uh, four or five months ago at the meeting that you said that the the future of public education in Pennsylvania was very bleak in regards to funding. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that in, in regards to this point here as well? Do we want to go home tonight? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we all know what's going on in Harrisburg. I mean, there's a lot of unfunded mandates. We're running into issues with the, with the pension crisis. We all know about that. We're going to run into, I believe, three or four years down the road where both school districts are looking at 30 percent uh, pension. If anybody's in business, think about paying their employees 30 percent retirement. Now, you say the state picks up about half. Well, we pick up the half to, and the school district picks up the other half. We have issues with special education where funding has not increased. Um, we have uh, cyber charter schools where we have children that live in our district that can go where they want, where we pick up the tab, even though we do have cyber education available. So there's a lot of things out there that do cause a problem. We have new evaluation systems. There's just a lot of things out there in a current environment where our governor is not exactly education friendly. So one of the concerns that is for me is from the dollar standpoint. I have been through mergers in the corporate world and, I, and again, what I said earlier is that for savings to occur typically in a merger is through attritional savings, which is through staff, or for locations to be combined or discarded. Um, we cannot get away from the fact that we are going to be running into some issues with funding. We need more, we're going to need more money. And the bottom line is, is when you look at it on paper, there's not enough savings to cover. Right now, there is no answer out there from Harrisburg, and we are limited with what we can do or what we want to do from a taxing standpoint with the community. And, and if, we talk, if we were to merge, wouldn't we have more ability to uh, combat those problems? We have more opportunity to combat some of the situations? Potentially, but initially, no. Uh, what happens is but if, if, you, if you just long term, it well, yes. well, Russ had mentioned about millage. Let's just play the millage game right now. We're about four times bigger, correct? You're worth three mills more, which means we have about three quarters of a mill we would have to cover, which is the dollar figure Dr. Fry talked about. So when you get right down to it, that's just that's a shortfall that we would have to address and overcome. The only way you can overcome that is to have savings on the other side. I've said it before, and I think a lot of other people at the table, we need it to be, to even consider it, it has to be tax neutral. So I understand where you're coming from. Unfortunately, there is not an easy answer, especially from a funding issue to, and the only way we could do it is the tax their way out of it and the, the state wouldn't even allow us to raise taxes high enough to get out of the mess work. And that's every school district. Um, also, uh, to the point that was raised about uh, furthering the education of the school district, um, over the past year, I would say, uh, the high school has added three new classes. And they've also, um, I, I know I addressed most of the board members about uh, adding a business class that would be mandatory for all students to continue the education standards. And I believe, um, Dr. Moyer, isn't it correct that uh, there would be at least 20 new classes that Antietam offers that we would get as Exeter students if we were to merge? All right. Um, I would love to see 20 new classes. And there are three new AP classes that I would love to take that would prepare me for college. And I'm sure it'd be the same thing. Um, do you know the number of AP classes that Antietam students would get that aren't offered by Antietam? 12. And what colleges are really looking for right now is the ability for a student to survive properly in college. If we give them, each and every student of both districts, the tools to best enable their ability to succeed in college, isn't that what we're ultimately here for in public education? That, that would be the question that I would raise. And 
That is why I would support this more merger, and I hope that all board members will vote in favor of this. Thank you very much. Thank you. You have a lot of uh, different districts. You have a lot of locally titled classes that are essentially the same class, but they may look different in terms of their title. So I believe that a lot of those classes are overlaps. There are a few unique courses that um, are offered in Antiques that are not offered uh, in ours. It's, it's not 20. Um, and obviously, just by the nature of our size, uh, there are many more courses that we offer, and, and that's actually, you know, and that's what Antietam wants to do. They want their kids to have more opportunities, which I agree with. Um, but but there wouldn't be 20 different courses in terms of the AP courses. I'm sure Dr. Mays probably knows right off the top of his head. I know we just looked at that uh, recently, uh, and, and I don't recall that there were AP courses that we didn't already offer on the list um, of the data that we gave to uh, to, Do to Dr. Davies a couple weeks ago, but I'm, I'm not sure, Larry, if you, if you know the answer to that question. Actually, uh, <laughs> actually I think it's, I think there's one that is that's different. That actually wasn't my question. Okay. I was just commenting on something that I saw this morning. Um, in regards to interpretation, interpretation. Okay. Um, in regards to the building issue, um, it's obvious, definitely based on kindergarten class sizes, that enrollment, at least in Exeter Township, is trending down. So, why the concern that we need more buildings? Another thing, when Lausch Originally, the board said we need a fourth elementary school. That's why Watton Creek was built. But then after Watton Creek was built, it's like, oh, we don't need a fourth elementary school. We're going to take Lash offline. I was at the meeting where the vote was to take Lash offline, but it was stated at that time that if the need arose that we needed more space, we can bring Lash back online. So we have a building. I know it's being utilized right now for the school board. Um, the other thing is, with closing down, if we do merge and we do have extra buildings and we close down, my understanding is, if you have vacant buildings that aren't being used, charter schools have first dibs on those buildings. So, the township looks to pay about $10,000 per student that chooses any alternative education, whether it be cyber school or a charter school. So we're almost opening the door for greater expenses if we're opening the door for a charter school to move into a vacant building. So then that's another cost that's not being factored into any of these studies. Potentially. Potentially. So that's just what I wanted. And also my confusion was regarding the buildings and shutdown. <coughs> um, it was said that per uh, Dr. Moyer that Antietam students wouldn't require any busing until the high school level. But it was stated also that Wrightson would become an elementary school, and we need four elementary schools. So with the three current elementary schools in Exeter and Wrightson, so does that mean an Exeter elementary school would close? Because based on the statement that Antietam students wouldn't need to be bused until the high school level. But if we're keeping an Antietam elementary school, Wrightson becomes an elementary school we have three other elementary schools. It's one of those closing. Dr. Moyer is not a member of either of these boards, and uh, I can't answer for his. No, we haven't decided. Okay, I'm just basing it based on what he said. Uh, yeah, he's, 
Denise consult? Okay. No, I know you didn't, but in this, you said there would be four elementary schools, and we and the discussion here was right that we become an elementary school, bringing our total to four. However, you said busing for Antietam students wouldn't be necessary over here until high school level. So where are the Antietam elementary students going that they don't need to be bused to extra schools? Then that's five elementary schools. Right, so that doesn't make any sense. Thank you. Okay. Good evening. Joseph Boyle, 208 Mayor Street, Exeter Township. First, I'd like to say thank you to both school, school boards for their energy and their candor through this process. Uh, you've been uh, facing some very unique situations. As an educator, though, you know, I'm saddened when I hear some of my own uh, Exeter Township people always saying, what's in it for my kid? Well, it'll benefit both school districts. I appreciate the first gentleman asking Dr. Martin, what is your, you know, what is your perspective? And I really respect you saying no, but you would consider a regional high school. I think that is a very fair solution. But the one thing that I'm asking as an Exeter Township resident is that we consider so many variables here. I don't want to continue down this road that our fathers and our grandfathers had deliberated for many years. As far as I'm concerned, they've made mistakes. This should have happened a long time ago. Both kids from Exeter and Antietam will benefit. That's my number one concern. <clears throat> Through the community, I hear some of the Exeter people, it sounds as if like they're looking at the Antietam kids like they have leprosy. That's wrong. You're looking at the complete person here. Let's not forget, we've had shootings conducted by other kids within their communities. Bringing that back home though, I really feel as if a very diverse population comes into play. We've been sharing community boundaries for years. Before the state comes in and shoves us down our throat, I ask everybody to have the courage to make the right decision. I am in support of a full merger. But I do appreciate what Dr. Martin had to say. That's something that I had not thought of previously. So thank you for your time, again, your energy on both boards we have, and good luck. Thank you.
when rice had opened. And it's an expensive school. And it's a really nice school for our children to attend. And my daughter enjoyed you know, the updates that were made on the high school while I lived here in Pennsylvania for the past 17 years. She's enjoyed that. You know, and my little daughter goes to Watton Creek, beautiful school. Yes, we've spent 15% more debt than them. But if I look at their schools, which I drive past, and I have never been into them. I'm sure that the teachers are lovely. But I can say, it kind of feels like if I was living in a row home, but you're asking me to pay taxes for an Exeter home. And I now understand that really our taxes aren't going to go up with the proposal. Or I kind of appreciate that information, which I didn't understand. And I also understand um, Mr. Quinter explained that our tax base is going to be wide, but I would be concerned that in the future that they would take advantage of that widened tax base and increase us all. And so I guess those are my biggest concerns about it, about the merger is that, yes, we have more debt and we also have nicer schools. And maybe that's selfish of me to say because I live in Exeter and because my kid probably goes to a nicer physical building, not saying anything about the teachers or staff. But where do our where do we draw our line with taking care of our neighbors? You know, do we extend our line to Reading City School District because they don't have as nice of schools as us? I mean I just I'd like a little more information I think before I okay, uh, with if, this. If you went in the Antietam schools you would find them to be uh, very similar to ours. Uh, there really is no difference. Uh, ours are newer I guess only because they built theirs first. So, uh, that, and Mr. Moyer's group made a review of all the facilities, and they're all in excellent condition. So the facilities really are I have six one and a half dozen. Thank you. Um, has anyone actually considered the you know three to four hundred kids of junior high school students that would have to be bused over it, there, and then the one to two that, that would have to be bused back here? That would be just like now we have districts in the district. Okay. Some people go to Watton, some people, people in Riken go to uh, Jackson Wall because they used to go to Laos, which was supposed to be here. You know, it changes all the time. And we could take advantage of the physical proximity of Antietam to many of our villages, settlements, areas, residential areas. No, I'm not talking about taking someone from uh, from Lorraine and sending him to junior high over or to the senior high in As a matter of fact, the person in Lorraine would probably feel no difference. But uh, there's we have developments that are closer to the school schools than the other. So you would be going with so you try and keep the same place together and make a decision for the future. And then I just have one other comment about the possibility of our special needs kids being moved to by themselves location. Not going to happen. Thank you. Jordan Yanis, I'm an Exeter resident, um, excellent educator, and um, and I appreciate all the board members' countless hours that you put in. I know that it's a thankless job, so I appreciate your time this evening. Um, there are a couple concerns that I have um, that I just want to share this evening. Um, in looking at the the number about losing 15 staff members by attrition, I know that every board. Um, that is the last thing that they want to do is to reduce the number of staff um, and to see that number in black and white. It's just very frightening to me. And I think with today's economy and how many people are prolonging the time of retirement, um, I'm not sure how accurate that is. I know that we're all focused on the bottom line. Um, I'm not sure how clear that was with the packet that I received this evening. And um, the concerns that I have about um, the charts for 
model one for capacity for the secondary building. Um, looking at that one for grades 9 through 12, um, the capacity is negative 20. Uh, so I'm not sure where the extra 20 students would be. So then that leads me to look at the model one, which puts us back at a, a grade 7 through 9 configuration. And in working in a 7 through 9 building, there were many challenges. Um, the, the problems of a 7th grader are so vastly different than the problems of a ninth grader. Um, there are issues with students that are advanced and are looking to take courses um, above what their, um, their grade level is, and it um, poses challenges. And we're able to deal with that at Exeter because our buildings are in close proximity, but when we're starting to split up junior highs and have a middle school, however they're phrased, and we're trying to have students, you know, is the course that they need going to be available at the, at the school that's closest to them? Or are now we going to have a need for more transportation to get students? No, it would, be, it would be a mirror image. What is available at our the junior high here would be available if the Antietam Senior High was a junior high. Right, but if it's a junior high student, a ninth grader who is taking an advanced level course that's not offered. The ninth graders will be in the high school. I'm looking. I, am, I, I know what you're looking at, but my superintendent has told me the ninth graders will be in the high school. Therefore, the ninth graders will be in the high school. I am not an educator. I am an old well, helicopter pilot. Well, I'm going to have to go to the model one that says after the senior high grade, you tend to be self, so I'm not a fear of that. No, I, Dr. Martin told me they'll be in the high school. I fly helicopters, I fly jets, but I do not do education. Right? Okay. Um, yeah, and in looking at the, the cost of the savings that we have compared to the entire budget of our district, um, I think that that cost savings is negligible when we look at the entire budget of the district. And when we look at the reduction of even just the central administration staff, um, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, I don't know exactly how, many, how long ago it was, probably about a year ago, and before Dr. Davies joined our district, and Dr. Martin was the superintendent, as well as all of the other responsibilities that, you know, would one superintendent want all the responsibilities of their current job and an additional district? Dr. Martin is a glutton for punishment. <laughs> he doesn't agree with me, but he I says just, whatever the boards decide. <laughs> so those are my concerns. The added stress that, you know, it feels to be an education that we're always asked to do one more thing. And, and we we step up and we do that, but in doing one more thing and taking on an entire district um, is just another reason why I'm not in support of this. Thank you, ma'am. Hello, I'm Amy Noble, and I'm actually an Antietam School District uh, resident. I felt compelled to come up just so you can see the face of someone who is um, affected by this, but yet not. I moved into my home nine years ago and wasn't thinking about children. I now have a three-year-old and a six-month-old. Um, so, of course, I'm interested in, in what's going to happen here. And I would just ask that people look at the long-term goal here. Uh, you know, obviously, it's the education of the children. I'm not here because I want my taxes lower. I would pay more to know my kids are getting a good education. So. Again, a few years of inconvenience, a few years of some hard work uh, will pay off in the long run for my children and a lot of other children. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Lee Hayes. I live in Mount Penn. Um, I want to thank both boards for your time. Mr. Blair, I'd like to thank you very much for your public remarks and acknowledgments and comments that we exchanged back and forth in this project. Also, thank you as well for recognition of your remarks. Um, I did grow up in Mount Penn. I'm a 1986 grad. I grew up in a well home in Mount Penn. My <laughs> grandfather lived with us. He was a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania. My father was a doctor. My oldest brother's a doctor. My middle brother is a doctor. And after years and years of therapy, 
I have learned how to handle being the only one not called doctor. In my <laughs> I'm working through it. I'm getting it. It's all this story. Um, so, I went to school in Philadelphia, North Philadelphia. A lot of diversity. I graduated 68 people in my senior class in Halifax. I was the president of my class. I was an outstanding athlete. I had very good friends that went to Exeter Township. Uh, Kevin Tenefranca, who's very successful today, he's a orthopedic surgeon. Steve Richards, who's one of the leaders in the film industry. If you don't know him, you should find out and archive him. I have friends, uh, Dr. Hyman, he's the nation's leading researcher at Harvard. And Greg Tusi, who is the chair of the department uh, at Harvard. We have some wonderful people that come out of our community. But we don't have a business base. Our market has changed. How many people are going to graduate from Antigua in the senior class this year? I think we're at 86 this year. 86. Right, I'm wrong. So on this side, and I'm sure if anybody left or came here, there's 67 up here. So we'll add a few more rows. This model doesn't survive in society today. You're out of Lehigh. You don't have Ivy Walls here. It's a solid university. We're scrappy people in our community. We have a lot of pride. I would just ask that your decision be come to it shortly. Listen, I can crack numbers. Dr. Jamira, I know you're very good with numbers. You can probably tear a balance sheet apart in your capacity. You're certainly very familiar with the educational system. I've done a little research on your background. So with that, there's dollars and there's cents. This works. It works on paper. I worked for the largest investment firm in the world. Had the greatest pay degree, a trillion dollars in assets under management. And two and a half for five years ago, it sold for $2.16 a share. I was picked up for a sale. Times change. Our lives go through. We work for one company and we think we're the greatest company in the world. When things change, we move. I moved on the other side of town at a 6,000 square foot home, and all I did was go for the days of the row home lifestyle, keeping to your roots. We're similar. We don't have free heads. The website has so much vitriolic boarding out there that it's painful when I ask you just to shut it down. It's not productive. I don't think it's going to sway the board's decision. We have 150 people in this meeting tonight. We have 4,500 students. I think that's almost a comment there that you don't have two and a half thousand parents here tonight speaking against this merger. I think there are words just being said in that by their attendance not here tonight. So we'd ask that in the sake of humanity for our community that we move to a decision quickly. We can study the numbers. And I promise you, I can go through the numbers. I'll sit down with you. And there are good savings that can be realized. We have a very strong tax paying base. We're solid. You pick up assets, you pick up buildings. Somebody mentioned over here, I think there's an opposition, that the buildings can be leased out. If I recall, I think Daniel Boone just struck a deal for a pretty heavy to lease their building out. There's a lot of revenue generation. But we're solid taxpayers on paper. We have very strong underlying bond rating. So there are a lot of great acquisitions. This is a nice pickup. I look at M&A all day long, and this is attractive. So with that, thank you for your time. Hopefully we can move to some sort of resolution and something at least before the upcoming election. So with that, I thank you for your time this evening. Thanks, Drew. Hello, my name is Brian Smith. I have two sons who go to Watton Creek, one in kindergarten and one in fourth grade. Both my wife and I love the school and we love the teachers. We couldn't be happier with how things are going at the school, and to date, the school has blown away our expectations. I am afraid now, however, that agreeing to a full merger will cause the district to take a step backwards instead of a step forward. I've read all 270 pages of this study, and it's obvious to me that most of the pros are on the Antietam side, and the majority of the cons are on the Exeter. <coughs> Every time that something is handed out as a printout, we see the pros and cons, but it's always blended the two together. I want to see the pros and cons for the extra side only. And I ask that the school board uh, take a hard look at that. While it's a nice gesture to try and help our neighbors, I don't want my kids' opportunities to suffer uh, because of that, or nor do I want to pay higher taxes. I've heard one board member recently <coughs> make a comment that we should just get it over with and merge because the state will eventually force a merger. In my opinion, it's very short-sighted to vote for anything just to get it over with because something might eventually happen. If and when the governor of PA forces the schools to merge, then we deal with it. 
Until then, I suggest our time and resources should be spent on making extra schools better. Considering all the negatives and so few positives, I don't understand why several board members appear to be pushing so hard for a merger. I'm waiting for somebody to show evidence of a merger of how it will benefit Epson. The gentleman who spoke a little while ago said it would benefit both schools, yet he couldn't give one example of how it would benefit Epson. My point is, it's easy to say it will benefit both schools, but you need to prove it to me. Give me some statistic that shows how it's going to. Give me some facts. Don't just say that it's going to happen. And with all due respect to the gentleman who did the study, I have zero confidence in him. It's clear he overlooked a lot of facts, and he couldn't answer some simple questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Ted Isselman, Exeter Township, 5 Courtney Ray Circle. Um, I don't know finances, so I can't speak to that at all, but I do know education. Um, and as an educator and a former admission counselor, I look at rigor and I look at reputation. And Exeter and Antietam are not comparable. Um, when you look at measures like SAT scores, when you look at measures like PSSAs, when you look at keystones, Exeter outperforms Antietam on every one of those measures. Uh, when you look at the reputation of the school district, uh, a measure that we used to look at at colleges was the percentage of four-year student, uh, students going on to a four-year institution. Um, Exeter outperforms Antietam there as well. Uh, my concern as a parent you know, of students coming up through the Exeter School District would be that, uh, that the reputation of the district would be diminished through the merger, uh, that the academics would potentially be diminished because uh, they're not comparable. So I would hope that from an educational standpoint, we look at that and we look at uh, the in in inequality between the, the academics between both programs. Thank you, sir. Hey, uh, my name is Amy Brandt. I'm a resident of St. Lawrence Borough in Exeter Township. Um, in addition to some of the cost inadequacies that were mentioned that we would like to now be part of the consultant study, I would also like to bring up um, a couple things. Um, I'm not sure if there's ever bud budgeting that, that's associated with PSSA and how much funding is received, but everybody, if you read the 300 page report, you could see the, the differences in the PSSA, PSSA scores and what that could possibly do to the funding that we receive should those scores, you know, go up or down. Um, in that, in that it's irrelevant. Time. It really is irrelevant. Okay. Um, the, um, also in that study was a facility condition index by building. So I know that both models involve the use of the Antietam Junior Senior School currently, but that was the lowest condition rated next to, next to Lausch. Lausch came in at a two, which I'm not quite sure why, and the next rated was Antietam Junior Senior High, which gives it a poor rating. So that to me is going to be an expense either for what needs to, to be upgraded to that building in the future or you know, why, why are we considering even using it if it's the lowest rated of all the schools that we're looking at. Um, we shouldn't just be looking at capacity. We should be looking at the condition of the schools as well and whether that's an expense. Um, also, um, we're not, not only transportation costs for the, the redistricting or whatever happens, but also you'll need um, for the junior high, the split to junior highs, you'll need activities buses <coughs> probably to come over to, his, you know, whether Antietam students or current Exeter students who get moved there, they're going to have to be bused over here. I don't think that was considered. And then finally, um, to use um, Dr. Finner's language um, to be revenue neutral. Um, and to also talk on what Dr. Martin spoke of is, I, I know that, the, that when the use, if it's decided that the, that the merger goes through and the, the Antietam Junior Senior High is going to be utilized, um, <coughs> speaking from the steering committee min minutes from July, they're gonna look at the group of kids and where they're located within the boundaries of the two districts to maintain an efficient transportation model. I get that, it all comes down to dollars and cents but my kids are going to be part of those 400 kids that are going to get disrupted. Their 
the Antietam kids will get, if, when you go to a, I'm actually a product of the Mount Penn School District as well. I was in the class of 1988, I graduated with 62 kids. I got a great education there, I loved it, I have friends to this day. But when you go graduate with 62 kids and you have an influx of 100 kids come into your, into your school, it's obvious that they're there. But when you have 300 kids going into a school of a couple thousand, they're just new kids. M more friends, more people to associate with. It's really not that noticeable. And I know, thank you, I know from, you know, I, I would like to see some what has been discussed as far as redistricting goes and whether or not that's been addressed yet at this point. But based on my location in St. Lawrence Borough, to the proximity of the Antietam Junior Senior High School. My kids have now, I have a daughter who just started in this school this year, right then. She has made two new schools worth of friends this year. And now she has to say to them in two years, see you in three years. And she, she'll, she won't see those kids. They're, the 400 kids are the ones that are gonna get disrupted here. And my kids are part of that. And to me, what the other mother said about, is about the kids. My kids already know about this, and they're already upset about the fact that they have to go to a different school instead of move on with, their, with the people they already know. You make an assumption there that has no basis in fact. Well, I saw, I did read three, the, most of the 300-page report, and I saw the models with all the dots on the map and all the grid lines that were drawn around it, and I live within a couple miles of that school. I don't want to make any assumptions, but I only have to assume I'm, I'm just on saying that you are making an assumption that has no basis in fact. I'm just uh, I live right up the hill from you. So uh, is my granddaughter going? I don't know where my granddaughter's going to go. You know, that's, I appreciate your concern, but... Uh, Dr. Martin's comment before spoke to the fact that, you know, there are alternative models here that could be discussed, which I, and I gotta tell you, I'm in favor of the merger for the kids because it's about the kids and what, what the kids at Antietam School District deserve. They deserve to be well-funded and, and to have opportunity and to, to have the opportunities that we have. But I don't want my kids disrupted in the process. Thank you, ma'am. Denise Lamborn, Exeter Township. Uh, I just have a couple things. I, a lot of the, the opinions that I have have been very well articulated by some of my neighbors. So I'm not going to belabor the point, but um, if I understand the comments that were made by the board uh, just a little while ago, it seems like to us Model 2 is the only feasible model at this point because that's the, that's the model. Unless I am willing to face Dr. Martin's rep. Okay. Which I'm sure you're not. So, all right. Sounds like sounds like we're going with model two if we if we do this at all. And then the oh, let me say an adjusted model two. We, as two boards, would sit down and decide what the configuration is. Uh, we talked about closing some buildings. That wasn't discussed in the model two that you've seen. So, the two boards. We have a steering committee that meets, and we would work on the best. What well, we really want to know how this was, could we fit everybody in the high school? Well, that's my concern. And that, the report doesn't exactly bode well for that when I see that negative number at the bottom line for grades 9 through 12 with a negative 20. And I feel like assuming that we're going to have a decrease in enrollment <coughs> is a mistake. I feel like that's bitten us on the backside a few times previously, like when we built a lot in Creek, when we need a fourth elementary school, closed that, built Riceton thinking we'd need an elementary school. It just seems like these uh, projections can't be something that we can count on when we're looking at, right now, the number being a negative number in terms of capacity. Um, and if we were to cram everybody into the same high school, then what would that do? You know, I have concerns about the quality of education in terms of the uh, class size, student-teacher ratio. I feel like the quality of the education that we would be offering these high school children would suffer. 
so those are the concerns that I have just on a logistical basis. Thank you, ma'am. Hi, Kim Farinelli, Exeter resident, also an MTU grad, actually a Mount Penn High School graduate. Um, this is a very stressful time for not only students and parents and hearing on um, both sides because I am friends with both people in Exeter and Antietam. I previously stated at a previous meeting that I moved out of the Antietam School District once I had a child and decided to move into the Exeter School District based off of research. Lots of research, as a matter of fact, that my pastor had passed on to me as he was researching moving out of the only school district to move into another school, school district in the, in the county. Handed over a nice binder. Actually, it was more than 300 pages of this study. So he did a nice research, and I think I picked a school district that I am enjoying that my daughter, currently at Rifton, is in right now. It was at Jacksonville, moved to Gowan, and fabulous teachers. No condescending remarks at all for Antietam because as I went to school with Joe and Amy and Lee, who also spoke tonight, I just wanted to say that I am also a product of your school district. I think I'm pretty successful. I think that there are things that have come out of schools that are phenomenal. So not looking for any condescending remarks because they just fly within the community. What I think is important here is to look at all options because it is stressful. In looking at this, why not project? Uh, what I hear is ambiguity. I also hear out uh, of the data that a little, you know, that's kind of vague. I'm in business and I like to see bottom line dollars. Otherwise, why not just hypothetically start thinking about how districts could be a full county district? So, why, if you're looking to expand a tax base and also have building capacity, why not stop at Antietam? Why not merge with? having a large county school. I mean, why, why don't we jump the gun? So with that, is start looking at a variety of other options. And that's to any school district. So if you want to be hypothetical and have ambiguity, why not throw it all caution to the wind and offer up a variety of other options? Because my daughter is a student. I am also a parent. There's a lot of emotion behind this. And if you can't see that, it might not be represented here because a lot of people don't feel comfortable standing in front of a microphone and making themselves present standing here. I speak and I also train and I also teach at the local community college here. I have no problem getting in front of people and guess what, right here I'm nervous. You hear it in my voice, you see it in my shaking because it's not comfortable, okay? So although there's how many residents in Exeter and how many residents in Antietam, it's shameful that they're not all here expressing positive or negative to this because it's impacting their children. It's impacting their finances. And yes, as much as I'd love to be a good neighbor, I'm not at church every Sunday. I'm not at my neighbors paying their taxes. I'm not working hard. I have two jobs. I work for a manufacturing company in this county, which you don't see a lot of steel makers on the East Coast of the United States. You also do not see, you know, a lot of people going out there and working like that. Although people have three and four or five jobs. So yes, there's a reality that it comes down to sometimes my, my pocketbook. But I'm not looking at not having an opportunity for children. So it's hard and you have a hard job. So don't take it lightly. Because I would. Thank you, ma'am. Hello, my name is Charles Greiser. I'm an Exeter Township. I've uh, heard a lot of comments about the uh, two different school districts tonight, and uh, I'm a little confused as to why people will treat and team the school district as if it's a school district of lepers. I would assume that there's no one on the Antietam school district board that feels that they provide an inferior education to the children. Is that correct? So I think that most of the Exeter Township residents that have said that the Exeter Township uh, education system is far superior to the Antietam school district. I just don't think that's right. I think that everybody deserves good education. I also think that at some point, as someone has said, 
that the two districts will at some point down the road merge. Uh, I don't think it's going to be this year. And I would hope that it's not this year because I don't see a plan. I see some numbers. I see some guesses. I don't see a plan. I see on a daily basis my son goes to school on a half empty school bus. I hear stories about children going to cyber school because they've mouthed off to their teachers and said, it doesn't matter what grade you give me, I'm going to go to cyber school next year and you're going to pay for it. Okay? I think that there are ways that our school district can save dollars now. And then when we straighten ourselves out, we can consider a merger. I think that maybe considering a merger at this point in time, before we have a plan in place with bogeys on savings, is a mistake. I think that if we look at a plan that says we will have this date to achieve certain goals, and we will complete a merger by X date, I don't see that in this. I see numbers slapped on paper. And until we have that, I just don't think it makes sense. An explanation. This report that you see tonight was a request for information by the steering committee who are making those decisions that you're talking about. So this is an interim report to provide us with more information. But until we have something that would provide us with a plan for savings, I just don't think it makes sense. The Exeter Township School District has a budget of $65 million. Right, roughly, plus or minus? Antietam has a budget of $15 million. Plus or minus? $80 million. We have $80 million and we can't find any savings? That's ridiculous. That is absurd. You want to go revenue neutral on $80 million. That to me makes me sick. I pay almost $10,000 a year in taxes in my township. It's a lot of money. I think that you should be able to find at least a 10% savings in this money. Revenue neutral, that's just a cop out. You guys need to find a way to save money. That's Thank all I have sir. to say. Last two speakers will wrap it up at nine o'clock. There about. Hi, uh, my name is Mike. I live in St. Lawrence. I am a product of both Exeter and Mount Penn. Uh, went to Mount Penn, uh, which then converted over to Antietam, and I also graduated from Exeter. I've lived in St. Lawrence for 17 years, and I've lived in Exeter for 50. Um, so I've seen this around the board several times between Exeter and, and Antietam. My question would be twofold for each board. For Exeter, what do you attribute to the success of your school district that you rank 153 out of 498 schools um, in your PSSA? test ratings over the last five years, what do you attribute as uh, the primary cause for Exeter Township to have achieved such outstanding goals? On the other side of the coin, to Mount Penn, Antietam, what would you attribute that you rank 456 out of 498 and that's not to be disparaging. I do realize that there's a poverty difference, an income difference between the two townships. However, both schools do receive state funding. Um, there is no child left behind. And it seems to me that there's a wide disparity between the educational programs of these two school districts that want to merge. So I would ask Antietam, what do you attribute to your school's low numbers and what have you done over the last five years to improve that rating and how can you assure 
to the students above the schools that if the merger were to occur, that the teachers are going to be the teachers for the children who are our future leaders of tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks, sir. My name is Bob Bechtel, and I'm an Exeter resident. And I understand what you said, Mr. Quinter, but if you can find a revenue neutral to increase $805,000 to teachers in Antigua, $982,000 lost in millage from Antigua, $300,000 in bus costs, legal costs, books, uniforms, why don't you do that now and save me some money? Because if you're finding the money, where are you going to find it? Where are you going to find $3 million? Do you have an answer? Yeah. Yes. Why can't you find, why can't you find $3 million now? I told you, I mentioned earlier. All right, this, I'm going to close. From the moment this came up, I made a promise to the residents of Exeter if this merger went through, it would not affect unduly your tax rate. Unduly, and that's exactly what I've said every time. And it would not affect the academic performance of our children. Now, there are programs and grants available that as a combined district, we can take advantage of. There are economies of scale we can take advantage of. So far as which school is better? Antietam has a great school. They do a good job. But if you look at the 11th grade four years ago at Exeter, they weren't so good either. So the point is, if we can take this merger with no increase in taxes and some savings and getting grants and money from outside agencies, why shouldn't we do it? If it will not hurt our children, and the reason our children perform the way they do is because of these professional educators who demand a certain standard of performance. They also have the advantage of good facilities, all the equipment that they need, which costs money. I'm sorry, it costs you money, it costs me money. But for my kids to have an education, I pay $10,000 a year also. Proud to pay it, pay it, thank you. Because that, that is one good deal. If it costs, it, think how much it costs to go to a university. 25, 30,000? We teach them everything. Okay. I think uh, Ewenberg, where I went, is about 40 now. Uh, Southern Illinois, where I went, is about the same. But the fact is, I had one taxpayer say he paid $8,000. He says it's the best deal I ever had in the world because I get three kids educated for $8,000 a year. Find me where else I can teach them how to write, how to get along with people, how to do science for $8,000 a year. No, it's 10. 15 includes all the facilities. All right, all right. It's, it's not worth more arguing over. Still a good deal. You know, you're, you're, you're doing it in Nittenoids. It's 10000 a year, basically. $65 million budget, $5,000 kids. Do the math. The math is that does not include the cost of an education. That is spread out for all obligations. It's insurance costs. It's uh, facilities costs over there. Thank you. Appreciate the education. Thank you, sir. I I called the uh, last uh, two or those two came. Give me two. Go ahead, sir. Okay, my name's Rob DeWald. I live down in the corner, and I can't speak for everyone, but I guess my concern as an Exeter resident is you look at nationwide, we're becoming a country of handouts, free handouts, entitlements. We have more people on food stamps now than we ever had. 
Okay, I work in the healthcare industry. I try to educate my coworkers. If you vote for this healthcare bill, you're going to be out of a job. We started with 12 therapists in the department. We're down to four. My hours are being cut. Everyone's hours are being cut. So I guess the concern is, is there's been talk, and I don't think that it's, you know, for me, it's not about leprosy or this kid or those kids. It's, it's the money. You said earlier to a person that came up here, it's all about the money, right? Well, in reality, in life, it is about money. You can't go down to the bank and get a mortgage based on how many degrees you have. It's about money. So I have to put my kids through college. And again, if I save for a 529 or some other type of form, and I don't have the extra 15000 a year when it comes time for my kid to go to school, I'm going to be penalized. I was brought up that you know you work hard, you save your money, you do the right things. But this country right now that we live in, if you do the right things, you're penalized. I mean, it just, concern is, is again, you know, it is a hard thing to come up here and talk. I mean, I appreciate everyone's up here for your time and effort. It, it does concern me that more of my neighbors, I'm the only one that I can see from my neighborhood in here. And I don't understand that because I don't know why people don't come. But it scares me too that we're in a situation right now with a health care bill that was passed and no one even knew what was in it. Even the president said on national television he didn't even read it. So I guess my concern is, is if you're saying that our taxes aren't going to go up, when is the last time our taxes have to go up? It's what they undo because they go up every year that the, that the governor doesn't pay the expenses. But there is no handout involved here. They're not looking for a handout. They've got a perfectly successful school district. They're looking for a combination. We're not looking to be a handout. We're looking to improve the education of our children in this area. And if I can do it revenue, revenue neutral, where it doesn't cost you any more, why wouldn't we do it? Well, I just think that it's frustrating for everybody. Maybe it is even for me. Frustrating you know, for me. I've been working on this Everybody's taxes now. are going up every year, and you know the cost of living is going up. Every year, the health care costs go through the roof. My wife, you know, we're on her health care plan, and we break even every year. So I'm, you, I'm, you, I'm on Social Security and this that I've heard you say all night, Dr. Clinton, that our taxes won't go up. Please, I'm not doctor or work for them. Every year they go up. And they go up higher than... What's that? I'm not a doctor, please. Uh, I'm just saying that every year our taxes go up, and every time I read in, in, the, in the paper, and they say that they're not going to go up past the state requirement or whatever that is, that the state doesn't allow. They go up over that every year. And it's going to happen again. Yeah. We haven't gone up that above that any year. Okay. We have never taken above the uh, Title One entitlement. Tiny bit last year because of the return and stuff. No, we don't. We don't take all of the exemptions that we're allowed. You know, and I guess there's a concern amongst residents, which again I said would, would would like to see more from my neighborhood. But and again, this isn't a direct hit, but I don't understand when I read in the paper that we were going to pay $5.7 million for a building that was worth 4.3. I mean, come on, that's common sense. Someday you and I will sit down and I'll show you where that was bullshit. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Yes, sir. Thank you very much to everyone for attending. Have a good night.